who is the God of Ezra Nehemiah? So what I want to do today is uh, just a reminder, all of my readings, it's somewhat framed by the context of they're coming back to a land, repatriation, which I argue is a totalizing force in the reading of Ezra Nehemiah. And we started to talk a little bit about identity, who is inside, and it necess necessitates the question, who is outside? Whoever's included means there's someone excluded. And it's excluded in a very forceful way. And so what I want to do today is kind of talk about the troublesome passages, Ezra 9, 10, Nehemiah 13, about the mixed marriage, as a way to kind of talk a little bit of how do you preach from this? How do you preach from these passages? What are the ways to honor and be responsible for your congregations for these passages that nobody preaches on? Because it's <laughs> kind of hard to preach on. And to begin with, I'd like to ask you a question to think through your own identity. Specifically, yesterday I asked you about two events one from your life and one from before your life that helped form who you are, that helped shape your identity. I want to ask you today, why do you preach? Why do you preach? And here's the catch. See a little asterisk there? I want you to answer in exactly seven words. No more, no less. Why do you preach? And kind of take about 60 seconds and think through. Why do you preach? Seven words exactly. About 15 more seconds. Yeah, I'm not going to have you share this necessarily or turn it in or put it in the Moodle site. It's just an exercise to help you exegete yourself. You have all arrived here. You've taken a week out of your life. Uh, you've applied and explained, and you're investing in nurturing your craft of preaching. You're all experienced too. Why do you do that? And I think the seven words that you wrote down have something to do with how you exegete these difficult passages. Not just why you do it, but how you do. And so to be very clear, I'm not a trained homiletician. Uh, I'm a biblical scholar. So these, from my perspective as a biblical scholar, as someone who resides in texts and someone who kind of cares about communities of faith, things I would want you to know when you approach some of these texts like Ezra 9 through 10, Nehemiah 13, um, the conquest narrative is a great example. Pretty much anything in the book of Judges is a great, like how do you, preach from these things. And uh, kind of what I'd like you to know, what I'd like you to think through, but it begins with who you are as a preacher. Why do you do this? Why were you called to do this? And why are you giving a big chunk of, of who you are to be here uh, to nurture this craft? And so I want to read through this passage one more time. And there's a lot in Ezra 9, Ezra 10, uh, Nehemiah 13. These, this one kind of stands out. And just kind of imagine I want to invite you to my church in Oregon, and I, I want you to preach, and I want you to preach on this. So as we read together, think, wh what would you strategize? How would you go about this as a, a sermon passage? Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have trespassed and married foreign women, and so increase the guilt of Israel. Now make confession to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. The people are many, and it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this a task for one day or for two, for many of us have transgressed in this matter. Let our officials represent the whole assembly, and let all in our towns who have taken foreign wives Come at appointed times, and with them the elders and judges of every town, under the fierce wrath of our God, on this account is averted from us. Only Jonathan, 
son of Ashahel, and Jez Jeziel, son of Tikva, opposed this, and the Shulam, and Shabbatai, the Levites, supported them. What is going through your mind as you're preparing this for a sermon? This is definitely not Matthew 19 or John 3, uh, but perhaps there's something different in there. You should probably notice right away that the way that you read the text, you've already begun the interpretive process, the intonation that I make. And so I have an exercise with undergrads uh, for a gospel class that I teach. We listen to the entire gospel of Mark from start to finish. You take away the text and you hear this and it's about two hours and 40 minutes. I just about kill the undergrads. But what they do realize, they, they come up with a couple observations uh, consistently when I do this exercise. One is that Jesus is a lot more angry than they recognize, you know, if you read through this. And two, the interpretive nature and how you say things. And so right away, there's ambiguity. Uh, in the middle where it says, it is so, we must do as you, as you have said. Are they angry? Are they happy? Are they resigned? That will show in your intonation. So when you read a passage in ancient Israel to a group that doesn't have access to a scroll and a text, you are the interpretive lens by which you read that. And this is kind of the lineage that you have as, as preachers. And so you look at this passage, and some of the things that I would kind of encourage you, and again, I'm not going to bring you necessarily theological comfort, and I want you to actually uh, appreciate that. This is not going to have a clean answer today. But the first thing that you, you do know is you want to note the lens of culture. And one of the most helpful phrases I heard uh, from a professor at SFTS who's now retired, a biblical scholar, he talks about his statement is about uh, the Bible as a cross-cultural document. And in, because of that, you want to get so much into the culture of ancient Israel as you can, which means exiting your own culture. So think about our passage and to begin to think about something like marriage. Uh, what is it in our life today and how does it compare in ancient Israel? And so one of the things about this passage is you have a return generation coming back to the land and they're there and they need to forge their identity. And if they don't do something very radical, they're going to completely lose their identity and completely assimilate to the culture. And that's problematic. And this has been something huge in repatriation studies. So with any immigration, when any social displacement, you have an issue of identity. When you're coming back to a land of origin, and you're coming back because you had ties, religious ties, then that question of identity becomes that much more severe. So remember, and this is a very natural thing. On Monday, I talked about my, my six-year-old at the time playing soccer in the neighborhood and coming back without any prompt from us, a six-year-old realizing he's not fully Korean, uh, but he's not fully American. So having to ask that question, that consciousness at that level. So one of the ways that biblical scholars have looked at this passage is really looking at this is the type of statement you have to have to make identity that is lasting. As you kind of look at that, you also need to balance it with kind of the pain and the hurt as far as how troublesome interpretation of this passage has been in history, not just in xenophobia, but in anti-Semitism when you see something like this. Uh, it wasn't till 1967 that the Supreme Court ruled that you cannot have laws that prevent races from um, marrying each other. And this has long ties, of course, to power and control and economics. Uh, when I talked to my indigenous theologian colleague at George Fox, uh, a lot has to do with being able to own certain lands and proving lineage. And so it wasn't like 1967 is not that long ago. Uh, my parents came in 1967, and the, the lens of that goes much deeper. Before I, um, before talking, I was hanging out this morning, uh, I got to chat a little bit with Emmanuel. He's in the back. He's helping me with IT and telling me the story of his own journey uh, from Ghana to Korea. His wife is Korean. And so you, you remember the, the movie Meet the Parents with Robert De Niro? Okay, just imagine that. But it's not a comedy, and it has Robert De Niro. It's like <laughs> Casino Robert De Niro, or Goodfellas Robert De Niro's. And there's nothing funny about this experience. Uh, and we all, and part of the reason I think 
Meet the Parents was so successful. Like, we all kind of relate to meeting the rents, meeting the in-laws, uh, going to that stage of life. We also relate to, um, when we get to the stage, our children and what we want for them as well. And ideals that are tied in good, good intentions often, uh, but also come out in ways that are very hurtful and corrosive and do damage to, to people. And so as you look at the lens of culture, you also want to look at the lens of interpretation and some passages that are very violent, some passages that are, that are very explicitly gendered, they're going to bring about pain in the congregation. And you, as the preacher, uh, have to have your pastoral sense of how you approach a text like that to honor the text, but also honor the people that you're preaching to. So repatriation here, this radical idea of kicking out the foreign wives and children is part of their effort to maintain their identity. And if they don't do something very radical, costly, then they're going to lose their identity. This doesn't make this a hermeneutical norm, which it was for a lot of interpretation, but this is something very radical. Again, this doesn't soften to the theology, but you want to kind of get behind the idea of the text, the thinking of the text. Why is it doing something like this? Another part of the culture, if you think of marriage in antiquity, marriage is essentially an economic transaction. So my grandmother and my grandfather, they met on the day of marriage. And they were teenagers. And it was just, uh, you know, marriages in Crete, even today, are often still arranged. They're, they're just doing different, they just do it in different ways. And something that you probably would resonate with, the level of marital satisfaction with an arranged marriage and a non-arranged marriage is actually equal. And part of the reason for that is if you're in an arranged marriage, your expectations are way lower. And so, <laughs> and that helps, you know, that helps. Uh, people still get, and so you match um, class, education, region, things like that. Uh, but in antiquity, marriage was a huge economic transaction. And so this is another thing we're realizing. When you add bridal gifts, dowry, you want to keep the land within yourself. You want to keep the wealth within your own family. And because of Numbers 27, we know that there is stipulation that foreigners can actually acquire the land through certain circumstances. Um, and so this was also an economic transit. Again, it doesn't soften the theology, but this is a very real situation of keeping it within the land. So uh, another example, um, one of my colleagues, is, he grew up on a cattle ranch in southern Oregon, 500 acres. Uh, you can't separate the cattle ranch. You can't divide the acreage among children. You have to give it to one, per you have to keep it within the family with one, usually uh, the eldest son who wants to maintain it. So his older brother is taking care of the ranch right now. With this colleague, the older brother doesn't have sons or daughters, does have children. And my colleague has uh, four girls that don't want to do anything with ranching and one son that also doesn't want to do anything. With, so the, the rant, there's a question of what's going to happen. But you cannot break apart the land. You cannot take the wealth of the family and put it outside. And that's a very real concern. So the culture kind of helps you get at it. At least look at this passage through the lens of antiquity rather than modernity. And I think that's something that might be helpful as you approach preaching this passage. You want to think about. Um, and so, I'm a little out of order. And so through the lens of culture, yesterday as kind of a brief reminder, I talked about identity through social memory, a story. Uh, I talked about identity through economic activity that you have, identity through wall construction. It was a symbol of how your ancestors had sinned, and it's now a symbol of how God is restoring you when you rebuild the wall. Identity through writing through fossilizing your social memory through written tradition, which stays the same once it's written, and through kinship language. Uh, we lost the language of tribe, of extended family, of clan, uh, and it's being replaced with a fictive kinship, where everyone is related uh, through an identity of worshiping the Lord together. Uh, identity is no longer spatially bound, but bound by a spirit of worshiping the Lord. And all these things, the way you forge identity, will kind of inform the way that you look at the lens of culture. In addition, I also would 
encourage you, consider how the rest of the Bible interacts with this passage. So when you preach, you have a passage, but our theology does not derive from any single passage of the Bible. And every book makes its contribution, every page makes its contribution. So there's something very unique in Ezra and Nehemiah, but that's not our only vision of God. One way I like to kind of point this out, so sometimes I, um, I teach students who are unfamiliar and uncomfortable with the idea of paradox of scripture. And so one very easy way, I, I like to take them through the creation narratives and talk about Genesis 1. And what if Genesis 1 was all you had about the Bible? You know, God's very powerful, very sovereign, very distant, uh, very orderly. And then look at the God of Genesis 2, um, or 2.4b to 3, I guess. Uh, <laughs> look at that God, and God is grieving and calling out to you and walking with you and has this very human form. It is not scary, but is approachable. Uh, calls out, where are you? Where are you? Which God is right? Well, both of them. And we lose if we had lost either of those creation narratives. Both are true. So when you have something as extreme as Ezra 9, 10, Nehemiah 13, uh, you want to kind of see how else the Bible deals with that. And you want to do this on a micro level and a macro level. And so one example, I alluded to the last verse of this passage. People oppose this. And I ask myself as I exegete Ezra 10, why is verse 15 included? And I guess, well, it was important for people to note that some, even within the community, knowing how hard it is to forge identity, knowing how important it is to keep the wealth within the, the household, they still oppose this because this was wrong. And I'm projecting that, but that's my interpretation. There was a reason that there are some people that oppose this. Uh, you know, when you're sending out foreign women and children, you're, it's almost like giving them a death sentence. They do not have kinship structure anymore to support them. They do not have land. They're out there sojourning anymore. That's a terrible thing. So you can imagine, as much as this gives you pain to read, the last verse might steer you a little bit towards comfort. Not only are there people opposing this, but it was deemed important enough, we're going to write this down. We're going to present some sort of paradox within this passage that is extraordinarily difficult within its limited context. You look beyond Ezra 10, actually. Ezra 621 is a really surprising verse for me. And so people have done work on this because if you read this, you should be surprised. And this is right after the Passover. They're talking about the Passover. So a very major celebration at the completion of the temple. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and also by all who had joined them and separate themselves from the pollutions of the nations of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. And the idea is that this is not referring to those that broke up marriages, but this is referring to people from other nations, people outside the tribe of Judah that are coming, and they are partaking in the Passover celebration. So how do you balance Ezra 621 with what we just read in Ezra 9 and 10 in Nehemiah 13? There's something about Ezra 10 that is not definitive because the people from outside are able to take care of, to partake in the Passover. And it's not about your genealogical purity, it's about separating yourself from the pollutions and worshiping the Lord. It's about your faith that can bring you inside. This is a tremendous verse in the midst of a book that is very exclusive, very uh, explicit in defining their community. Also look at Ezra 9, and look at the wording, consider the wording, the people of Israel, the priests, and it mentions the people to separate themselves, and this is the prologue to Ezra 9 and 10 about this commandment to separate yourself, and it mentions the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Well, this is now known to be some sort of allusion to different passages in the Torah. So Deuteronomy 7.1 is one of the clearest one when it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the, Hippite, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So most of these peoples, uh, they were not living during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So like the Hittites are long gone, 
Um, the Amorites are long gone. This is not language of current political groups at the time. So what I'm reading here is Ezra 9.1 is predicating 9 and 10 on obeying Torah. So is it possible that you can see Ezra 9.10 as really an injunction for radical obedience of Torah? And I translate Torah not as the law of God, but the teachings of God. There, there's a difference between the two. We need to be fiercely obedient to the teachings of God in order to maintain ourselves as a group, as the children of Israel. Fiercely obedient to costly forms. And I think this kind of alludes to this. And in fact, you get a lot of allusions to Torah, uh, a lot of exact words that they get from us. So uh, Deuteronomy 7 would be one. Um, Leviticus 18 is another when it talks about these four nations. And certainly in Ezra 9 through 10, it innovates. So in the past, it was the priests that couldn't marry outside, and Ezra Nehemiah takes it to a general genealogical lineage. It also takes away some of the notions of purity in terms of cleanliness, uh, more to genealogy, which completely matches what we free from the census. And so there's a different kind of feel from this when it predicates this with all these, like this wasn't an actual, they weren't concerned that they're marrying Amorites or Hittites, they were long gone. But there was a concern for obeying the Torah of the Lord. You also want to interpret in light of the rest of the, the Bible. And I know for preachers, the reflex, especially the reformed ones in the room, the reflex is to go to Jesus. So it's, that's, like, that's totally cool. Jesus is great. Uh, but kind of give yourself some, don't go there yet. Go to other passages in the Bible. Read um, Ezra Nehemiah in light of the rest of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and compare this to Isaiah. So Isaiah is really, especially the second half of Isaiah, it's really interesting because it also is situated in the Persian period. It makes note of God using foreign kings in order to be sovereign, uh, but it has a much more kind of universalist appeal in terms of who's in the community of God. It talks about nations coming, and here is one of the most uh, salient ver Isaiah 42, 6, I have given you as a covenant to the people a light to the nations. This is a lot less exclusivist than what we, we read. And so when you think about the mixed marriage crisis, it should be balanced with these passages, with all of Isaiah, especially from chapter 40. Think about Chronicles. Again, Chronicles has that direct link to Ezra Nehemiah. The ending of Chronicles is essentially verbatim to the beginning of Ezra. The difference is Chronicles has a very different theology of inclusion. It mentions tribes besides Judah and Benjamin. In Chronicles 9, 2, in the midst of all these genealogies, and some of the people of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh lived in Jerusalem. Well, that's interesting because according to Ezra and Nehemiah, it seems like nobody lived in Jerusalem, and Judah and Benjamin were the only people that were truly in. So you have to balance a little greater inclusion in 1 Chronicles 9. Think about Jonah. Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and crowd against it, for their wickedness has come before me. And then, we, of course, we learn... I don't know why I wrote 9-2. Um, uh, that's 1-2. Um, what we learn is that God cares about this, this nation. He cares about this people. So I look at the city of um, Tel Aviv or Jaffa, the port there, and as I'm in Jaffa, I think, you know, Jonah did exactly what anyone else would do. So if you go to the British Museum, and you, there's a whole section of Assyrian wall reliefs, you will see one beautiful relief, and it is the Siege of Lachish. This is the second biggest city in Judah during the time of the Assyrians, so like 2 Kings 18, 19, 20, uh, and you will see Judeans impaled on these rods, and you'll see heads taken off, and you'll see trees burning, people going into the city of Lachish, and uh, people being exiled back um, back to Mesopotamia. And this is a really great relief because if you look at the topography and you go to Lachish today, it, it actually looks the same. And that relief is a largely how we have a good historical anchor of when that siege came because we can dig and find the pottery of that type period for the siege. And so Jonah made the right decision. He would go in the opposite way. But in fact, this is such an incredible text because God calls you back 
to the place of your enemies. And in fact, uh, who is Jonah to care about what God does with them? They are within this, this greater inclusion, theology of inclusion in the Old Testament. And of course, the greatest example is the book of Ruth. These took Moabite wives. And the very ending of Ruth is a genealogy where a Moabite woman who is a widow, literally the most disenfranchised person you could have in ancient Israel, is now grafted into the kinship structure of the line of David. And so how, I would ask, would you take Ezra 9, 10, Nehemiah 13 as a definitive theological hermeneutic in light of these other passages in the Old Testament? And so when you read these difficult passages, when you preach from that, balance your theology and think what other parts of the Bible within the micro level, within the passage, contend against that, and also within the Old Testament itself. One of the things that we discover in the Western world, we're just less familiar and comfortable with paradox. And certain traditions of faith, it's, it's really difficult to get your mind around something that's not so definitive, but more um, to bring you back to Genesis 1 through 3, two different portrayals of God that I don't think they contradict, but they have two different viewpoints. Ezra and Nehemiah, the viewpoint is the repatriation. You go back to this country, you need to do very extreme things to maintain your identity because that is very important for us, to obey the teachings of Torah. But there are other viewpoints like Ruth, and a lot of these canonical scholars postulate that Ruth was included as a balance for Ezra and Nehemiah, as, uh, as something to help soften the interpretation and theology of some of the extreme viewpoints of a repatriation compared to another story about a marginalized uh, foreign female widow uh, who is, falls under the grace of God in tremendous ways. Ruth has its own theological problems too, gendered as well. And the same thing would apply. What do you read in Ruth in terms of power and gender, specifically in Ruth 2, and how would you balance that with other uh, theological texts in the Old Testament that would speak to that in maybe a different way. So the lens of culture, look at the rest of the Bible. I think it's really important, and I love watching this, uh, to model your confusion and frustration rather than resort to Jesus to explain all things. Uh, your sermon's winding down, the clock is ticking, you see it, you have a few minutes, you just go straight to the cross. Um, when you became a preacher, Remember how people perceive you differently. There's something about spatially seeing you, and it just depends also on your tradition, but seeing you being authorized to speak before a community, that changes the perception of you. So you get all these random questions on the Bible, right? Uh, random things people read, and they, they want you to be the expert on that. Uh, and there's actually temptation with that as well. Uh, you want to, and, and you want to honor and steward that. And I think it's a wonderful thing if you were to preach on Ezra 10, to admit and name, articulate your confusion theologically with this passage. Because surely there are people in the congregation that were deeply hurt by this passage, even by the reading. And by articulating your confusion, you're actually, it's an act of empathy with those that have been hurt. So you think about Ezra 10, in your congregation, you can have people thinking about their own narrative journey of their, their arrival here about their own history that might involve um, an embodiment that's not favored in America, an oppression they've experienced in real ways, or maybe even something in their subconscious. So I uh, grew up, I was born and raised in San Francisco, and uh, all my life I'd lived in three cities before taking my job in Oregon, and those cities were San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seoul, Korea. And then I arrived in Oregon, and I think that's when a certain racial consciousness arose as an adult, just physically by being in Oregon and raising a family there. And so uh, to think about ways that you can talk about, like I'm confused on, from the pulpit to admit that, and I think it's a great thing to not have to wrap it up cleanly in a sermon, to leave things ambiguous, because I think the scriptures are ambiguous theologically in many ways, certainly Ezra 9 through 10. But another thing I want to just really encourage you is to be bold and go for it. Uh, okay, so I have, I have a complaint against the collective of preachers in the United States, in Korea as well. Uh, what do you preach on? I love the Gospels. I love the letters of Paul, 
there's more in there. <laughs> there's a little bit more besides that. And, and I totally get it. I remember the first sermon I gave um, in Korea in the 1990s to a youth group. Uh, it was on, and it was a very youth groupy sermon. It was on David and Goliath, which was super cool. I remember the second, the second time, it was to a college group in Korea. Um, some of you have probably been to Yonsei University, and so it was on the university campus to the international college students there. And I remember preparing, I was just a young seminarian, and I started to prepare a passage, and I was so frustrated, like I was so unconfident in my skills that I almost went back and just kind of recycled the David Goliath thing because I thought it would go better. Uh, be bold and go for it. Try. Uh, passages like Ezra 9 through 10, things that you would think, I will never preach. This is so hard. Well, we'll just try it and, have some, and make yourself vulnerable. When I was in Korea, I was mentored by someone who was also Korean American, and he was doing the preaching, and he was a very um, reformed but also kind of uh, um, he, he liked to do chapter by chapter because his dad was a preacher and his dad did the exact same thing. And so he did the book of Joshua. And Joshua is kind of easy to preach for certain things and hard. So think about the division of land. But he preached the division of land chapter by chapter over the course of essentially over a year when he was preaching. And it was tough. And... Um, he would talk to me a little bit feeling like he got beat up by the passage sometimes. He got beat up by the passage. But he didn't hear this, I heard this much more because I was the associate pastor. Like how enriching that was for people because they had never heard a pastor speak on the division of the land to think about how this has meaning. And this has nothing to do um, at this with the way they, but just even approaching that text and for many of them, probably the only sermon they'll hear in their lifetime about the division of land. And so what you do when you preach on certain famous passages that are maybe more familiar, you are creating kind of a canon within your own canon. Uh, you're, you're making a statement that these are really important passages that you should learn. And when you do that, it says these may be less so. And so I encourage you to be bold, go for it. Um, and to know that me, even from, I guess, a professional space, I, I struggle with that too. Like apocryphal, like I, I never touched that stuff. It's hard, I, I don't know, I don't know how to go with that things, uh, with those types of genres. Um, but you see something that has a difficult meaning, be bold, go for it, trust, take the risk um, to do things like that. I want to briefly mention a few things and then open it up for another conversation uh, with identity. With identity, it's such a challenging reformulating question. So back to the six-year-old, back to Korea, the summer of 2014. Uh, this sweet boy who just moved to Korea, covered in sweat, asking me this genuine question, am I Korean or am I American? And so whenever my kids, when they were younger, they would come to me with, with a very serious question, as, as much as you can do at that age, I would have my routine. I would try to get to their eye level and uh, give them the full expressive attention. And I, so I looked Asher in, in the eyes and uh, to answer, am I Korean or am I American? I, I did what I always did. I said, I don't know, ask your mom, I have no idea. And, <laughs> And so he did, <laughs> that's actually, that's true. I asked him, um, why don't you ask mom, see what she thinks. And, uh, and so she asked, uh, she came up with that move, that parental move, well, what do you think? What do you think? And Asher said, six years old, I think I'm Korean and American. And uh, his mom said, you are right. You are correct in that. <laughs> the identity was formed in very real ways through the experience in a way that's unique. And in that soccer field, it was a liminal space, but it was still his space. That is fully part of who he is. Repatriation involves hope. Why do you do it? You're gonna face trauma, power struggles, quest for identity. So why do people repatriate? Why return it all? In fact, expand this. Why immigrate? Why come to a place where you might not be? And for some, it's coercive. You don't have a choice. For some, you're forced to. 
And this is also part of your own identity. When I asked you something before your birth that forms your identity, for some of you, it might have been that journey to the States, whether it was grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents, and then forms who you are. Why return at all? We know the reason partially with Ezra 1.3. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem and Judah to rebuild the house of the Lord. They're going to worship because they were not allowed to worship back in Babylon. For the first time, they're going to create this temple and to have the proper worship service. In Nehemiah, we know, so remember the repatriation, it wasn't one single event that they returned to. It was consistent stream of people coming back and back and back. And by the time of Nehemiah, several generations after the initial return, uh, the wall was still down. And so the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So he's in a crisis and he wants to go back to help lead a rebuilding of the wall. So why return at all? And so what we do think, what we do know is there's a reason underlying all of this is hope. And you see this in Ezra Nehemiah. Uh, despite the long journey, despite all the challenges that they face, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah ends in worship. It ends in a time of, of prayer, a genuine prayer. In fact, the longest prayer in the Bible in the Old Testament outside the Psalms is Nehemiah 9. And so they go through this experience of repatriation. They deal with identity. They deal with the, the people behind. And in, in the end, there is some hope. They talk about their ancestors, the sins of the ancestors, and they call on to God, remembering, remembering who God is. Tomorrow, I want to talk about this hope a little bit, specifically how this hope expands to who is the God and how do we worship this God in light of the repatriation? What are we to do and how are we to actively form this worship community?